last few years, so I think I've worn my voice out a little bit this morning, uh, yelling or shouting as somebody put it. So I beg a little bit easier this evening, so I hope everybody can hear. I think everybody's where they can hear me. And I may not go any louder than this. If you can't hear me now, you may need to move forward. I hate when people say that, but it's probably true. I do appreciate the chance to be here again this evening. I have been very distracted uh, lately. Um, I appreciate your prayers on my behalf. Uh, uh, some uncertainty over some professional things in my life, and so I've been very distracted in the last week or so, and I'm hoping to get that resolved this week and, and get things settled down, but I would appreciate your prayers on my behalf as well as I, I try to deal with those things. Our lesson this, uh, this, this evening, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, got it right the third time, is on the spirit of adoption. It's a lesson I was asked to preach over in Grand Prairie back in May, and so it's only been preached once. It's still pretty fresh. But uh, there's an expression that actually came up today in one of my Bible readings. Uh, I know. I didn't do that again. How about that? Glad to be here this evening. So this uh, expression from 1 John chapter 3, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Right? just an incredible thing if you think about it, uh, that God would want to consider us as children, that he would want to claim us. Uh, I know sometimes I look at my own children, I think about some of the things that they do, and maybe they wonder, would my dad really want to claim me today after the, the mistake that I've made? Uh, Reagan, I think, got in trouble once in school, and, and I got a call from the assistant principal, uh, who I actually knew from my son's school, so it was even more awkward. But uh, things like that come up and they happen and you wonder, would, would my parent even want to claim me today after what I've done? And here it is, God wanting to claim us regarding, even uh, despite the things that we've done. There are people in this world, and maybe even some here this evening, who are children by physical adoption in this life. And they are indeed very blessed uh, to be translated from orphan, to one without a family, to one who does have a family. Those who are adopted, though, into the family of God, into the, uh, through Jesus Christ, are blessed beyond this life. They're blessed even into the next life as well because of that adoption. And the New Testament church is a collection of people who have been adopted in that way. Adopted as obedient believers by God through Jesus Christ. Far beyond mere creation, but by this wonderful adoption that the New Testament describes for us. It really brings uh, into focus this expression that's again used uh, borrowing from the original languages and using ours as well, Abba Father, this call to God, this cry to God, and this intimacy that the child of God feels regarding him. Adoption is, I believe, uh, just an incredibly selfless and sacrificial act, uh, in some cases I suppose more than others, an act by which someone takes on the responsibility for children that he or she has not sired or born taking on a responsibility that no one could force upon them, that they are willingly choosing that they want to have upon themselves. There are financial and social and spiritual and moral and personal considerations that all go into that, commitments that are being made and responsibilities that are being taken. Adoptions give children a new chance at a better life, at finding love and support and companionship that otherwise would just go missing would not be present at all. And sometimes that, that lack can prove fatal uh, because of the alternative in which some of these children grow up in. Men and women who adopt children can surely understand firsthand, better than I guess the rest of us, a bit of what it means for God to look upon humanity with pity and to offer to adopt any who would believe and exercise what the Bible describes as a right to become a child of God. An extra element that the Bible describes it as a right that we have as believers to become, to be called children of God. I want to walk you through a few things here as we begin building this lesson, and we'll make some application in the, of the other end of it, but just a few uh, passages beginning in Exodus chapter 2 this evening, Exodus the second chapter. One of the most uh, famous examples of, of adoption, I suppose, in the Bible is found here in Exodus chapter 2. And that is the, in the childhood of Moses. In Exodus 2, everybody knows the story, I suppose, but we'll rehearse it again. Exodus 2 and verse 1 says that a man of the house of Levi went and took his wife, a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch and put the child in it and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. The sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. And 
When she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call the nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's son, then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him, and the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, Because I drew him out of the water. I guess the most amazing thing for me on that story, and there are a lot of amazing things, is that this mother gets paid for raising her own child. If there was some way that I could work that, I'd be all over that. But she actually gets, and, and that's just the providence of God in taking care of this woman and taking care of this exceptional child, exceptional really for what he's going to do, for what God sees to be in his future. But that adoption by Pharaoh's daughter in a place you really wouldn't expect it because knowing Pharaoh as we're about to know him, I guess, in this book, we don't expect any mercy or compassion at all in that household. Certainly not toward the Hebrews. And yet there's a recognition this is a Hebrew child. There's an acknowledgement of that, an acceptance of that. And yet there is pity and compassion shown as well. As we begin building this idea, that's what God is, is working from as he looks at people upon this earth. Hebrews chapter 3 picks up that theme with Moses again. Now many, many years later, thousands of years later, but in Hebrews chapter 3, and beginning in verse 1, the writer says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle, the high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, Inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. There's obvious blessing in being part of the house of Moses. And every Old Testament uh, Jew certainly would acknowledge that and, and celebrate that. Some in, in the first century, a little bit too much. They took great pride, too much pride, in being sons of Abraham. But what this writer is seeking to remind us and his readers all the way through the letter is that there is greater glory in being part of the house of Christ. And you are, if you've been adopted into that family by our faith. We need to be faithful, as Moses was faithful, Christ is faithful, we too. We need to be faithful to because we've received that great, uh, that great, uh, that great promise. We go back to John one, a passage I mentioned uh, in passing in the introduction. In John one and six, we move from Moses to Jesus and remain with him in this passage. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world. The world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It's unusual, at least in my study, to see something like this referred to as a right. Uh, as, a, as a citizen of the United States, I can exercise certain rights. Uh, in uh, Burleson last, uh, uh, last month, I went downtown at 7.45 in the morning. I had the right to cast a vote in a runoff election. To be honest with you, I didn't know a lot about either candidate. My wife told me to vote for this person. I forgot on the way, texted her when I got there, who am I voting for again? But I had the right to vote because I was a citizen of Burleson. I had the right as, as a citizen sometimes uh, to exercise privileges to buy a plot of land, uh, to vote, to do all kinds of things. But it's unusual for it to be described that way here. I, it's hard, I think, of God giving me privileges. But this is more than that. It's a right that we have as believers. But believing does not make us children of God. Believing makes us have the right to become children of God. And that's what we exercise when we, when we obey the gospel. Romans chapter 8. Sorry to go back to Romans again. I think we spent so much time there this morning, and then we're back again this evening. Romans 8 
in verse 1, and I'm not going to read all of this, but some parts of it. Romans 8 and 1, see that adoption that we enjoy, it's, uh, I believe most of us here this evening are already Christians, that we already understand. That's the purpose of the gospel. That's why we preach it. That's why we, we, we proclaim it on our websites and to our co-workers and friends and neighbors and, and why we proclaim it to our visitors as well and our children. There is verse 1, therefore now no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we <coughs> suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. I had a day about six weeks ago, five weeks ago, where everything went right. It was like every light was green. Not really, but everything that day went right. My car passed inspection. I was concerned a little bit about the tires. Passed inspection, no problem. Good, I'm not getting new tires. That's a thousand dollars that I don't have to spend right now just to pass inspection, because that's what happened last time. I tried to get my other Mustang inspected. And a couple of other things went right, and I was just, I was eating my hamburger for lunch thinking, this is my day. That was a day. You know, as I read this passage here, I'm thinking everything is just looking so right. Those last two verses. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit. We are children of God. We are heirs. And the writer says, if that isn't enough, you are joint heirs with Christ. What more could there be? What are we missing out on here? Absolutely nothing. It is all there. Every blessing that means anything. Because believe me, 30, 50 years from now, you're not going to worry about the things you're worrying about right now. I'm trying to tell myself that because I'm the one who needs to hear it, maybe more than you need to hear it. You're not. What's going to matter is right there. What's there? And that's the purpose of the gospel. Galatians, excuse me, Galatians chapter 3. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3, same writer. Again, I'm not going to read the entire thing, but it's a very similar parallel thought. As he talks about the superiority of this new law that gives us this right to be children of God. Uh, compared to the old law that didn't have the power to do that. And I'm just going to come down to verse 26. But again, the message, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Those were the distinctions that made a difference in the first century. Male, female, they still do to some degree today. Jew and Greek, slave and free and so forth. We have other distinctions that may make a difference today. Uh, racial uh, distinctions sometimes make a difference to people. The gospel says that that doesn't matter in the church. God doesn't recognize those things as making one group superior to the other. And neither should you recognize those as making one group. Poor and rich are distinctions that matter to the world today. They don't matter to God in that way. They shouldn't matter to us in the church. We are all children of God, brothers and sisters, and we ought to be able to overcome any differences and any temptation to prejudice that we feel because the gospel has that power. One more time here, Galatians 4. Uh, just down, I guess I, I quit right there, didn't I? Galatians 4 and verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. 
and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Inheritance is an incredible thing. I remember one time when I was 18 or so, I was talking to a friend of mine, and I happened to mention that my grandmother's last name was Wells, which means nothing to all of you in Alvarado, Texas. But in Tyler County, West Virginia, the name Wells is really prominent. Sistersville, which is the city I was born in, is actually named after the Wells sisters. Now that's, to me, is kind of creative and kind of not. Why not call it Wells something, but okay. But it was actually named after this family. Uh, the big hotel, the old hotel, okay, the only hotel in this town is the Wells Inn. And uh, so it's a prominent name in that county. And so my friend says, well, you must be looking at some kind of inheritance there because my grandmother had just died. And I just started laughing. And I think I laughed for about six or eight hours. And then I, I, my family has nothing. We are extremely poor. We have, there's no inheritance. There's nothing. It doesn't exist. And my children, I'm trying to make sure that they understand that that's still true. <laughs> that car in the parking lot's about all that there is. And I'm not giving that up willingly. It's going with me. So when I see this inheritance here, that's one I can count. And that's one that's far beyond the riches that my Wells ancestors could have saved and left for me or anything that I can prepare for my children. That inheritance is the one that I need to give them. But it's really one that only God can. I just need to make sure that they know about it and that they invest in it. If you are a son, then you are an heir of God through Christ Jesus. That's part of being adopted into the family of God. What an amazing consideration that is. And so we talk in our second part, the lesson about waiting for that adoption. We'll go back to the book of Hebrews in chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And back to Moses once again, one more time. Moses in, in Hebrews 11, verse 23. Because the ultimate purpose of the, this adoption is not just church membership. I think sometimes people are satisfied with that. They think that that is the equivalent of eternal life. It is not. Uh, there are some people that are going to be members of churches, names on rolls, in attendance, not necessarily going to go to heaven because of the presence of sin lingering in their lives that they don't repent of or that they conceal, or for whatever reason it might be. Sometimes we are satisfied with less. The ultimate purpose of the gospel in this adoption is to see it through to the end of eternal life. In Hebrews 11 and 23, the writer there says, By faith Moses, when he was born, we know this, he was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now that we didn't read in Exodus 2. It says here that he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. In this adoption, there is sometimes a cost that is attached to it. For Moses, it was that realization when he became an adult that he could not just continue being in the lap of luxury as the, child or, uh, the adopted child of Pharaoh, but that he had also to claim his Hebrew lineage. And he had to do that. And when he did that, it really separated him from that royal uh, hope that he had from him. It made him a great man, a great leader, one that we still talk about thousands of years later. But it ripped him away from what would have been a, a pretty luxurious life, to be a servant of God. I like how the writer here describes it as something that Moses would not have been acquainted with at all in those terms. And that is the reproach of Christ. He wouldn't have understood that language. But that's really what it was all about. It, it, in, in a sense, it was all about that cycle that continued on until Jesus came. The Hebrew uh, readers were suffering the reproach of Christ. They knew exactly what that was. Because they were Jews that had become Christians who were being persecuted by their neighbors and by sometimes their families in order to give up their faith. And they weren't doing it, at least at this point. They know exactly what the reproach of Christ was. And so the writer is trying to make them see that they're doing exactly as Moses did. They need to see it through the way that Moses did. To enjoy that. Yeah, back in Ephesians chapter 1, the writer is the Apostle Paul. And again, I just I, sometimes I love the words, the way it describes things. And that's the only reason that I look at it, is just for the verbiage. In Ephesians 1 and 3, he writes the beginning of this letter, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places of Christ, 
just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Acceptance. To feel accepted. To be accepted. That's what the Bible is telling us God does for us. He accepts us based on our belief and obedience to the gospel. He adopts us and he even says that he chooses us. He chooses us by that. John 14. John chapter 14. Part of being chosen by God, adopted by God through the gospel, is the adoption and the inclusion in his family. John 14, of course, is toward the end of Christ's life upon this earth. And we see him talking with his closest friends, his apostles, about what his departure was going to mean. They didn't yet understand or accept that he was going away. They are, however, concerned that he's predicting it. And so he tells them in verse 1, that not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. See, for us, it's easy to trust in Christ as much as we trust in God. I can trust in them equally. For them, God was the one they'd always know. Jesus was the one they were just getting to know for three years, but the one that was new to them and the one that was before them. That's not true for us. We've known them both at the same amount of time. So understand that where they're sitting, we've always known God. We trust in God. We know the temple. We've been there. Jesus is new, and we believe in him, but he's telling us things that don't make sense. That he's going to be a king, but that he's going to die. That he's going to redeem us, but that he's going to be captured and killed. And this doesn't add up. So understand why they're having the problems that they're having. So he tells them, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And I get the feeling that was designed to be the conclusion. That was designed to be it. That should have been enough. And yet, it's Thomas. And I, I love the question, because I have a feeling if I'd been sitting there, I wouldn't have asked it, because that's not me. But I would have thought it. And I would have thought, I hope someone asked this question. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, and Jesus doesn't appear to yell at him or tisk at him. or He just says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Go into my Father's house. I want you to go there too. That invitation is still the same today to all of us. That he's gone to his father's house. And he is coming again as he describes here. And that he wants us to go there and be with him. That uh, older translations had the word mansion there. I don't think it was in the one I just read it and noted. But that word mansion, I think, misleads people and sometimes makes them think in material terms. And, and I realize that even house can do that. But this is not about being a rich guy living on a hilltop in a mansion. And, and that song, even sometimes, sometimes that song gets to me a little bit. I've got a mansion to start with hilltop. I want a gold one that's silver lined. And, and I, sometimes, sometimes I have to stop. I, I cannot continue singing that song because it just it gets to me a little bit. It, <clears throat> I, that's another sermon. Sorry. That's not the design of what Jesus is saying here, to provoke in us materialism and covetousness. That's not what he's trying to do. The promise is not mansion. The promise is God's house. That language really is what is intended. In his house, there are many rooms. And there's one for you. He reserved it. And that really is what it's about, not a gold one that's silver lined. And I, I've read Revelation. I realize what's there. You don't have to tell me later on. Don't you realize what's there? I realize what's there. I just don't think it's designed to provoke materialism sometimes that it does. And I said that's another story. We are heirs according to promise. And that is the great thing about adoption. But there is, again, there is a challenge in all of this. Martin Luther said it is not imitation that makes sons. It is sonship that makes imitators. We are, and if you are, a, 
and you can think back to, and maybe you can already uh, still think in these terms, but uh, looking at your father and looking up to him and wanting sometimes to imitate him. That, that's a wonderful thing as a father. I think it's always impressive to us that our kids want to imitate us and, and act like us and put on our shoes and try to walk around when they don't fit. And that's a little bit of what Martin Luther's getting at there. It is sonship that makes imitators. When we are sons of God, we ought to be imitating Christ. We ought to be imitating him. Even as Paul writes, imitate me as I imitate Christ, as I imitate God. That imitation, it's not imitation that makes sons. It's sonship that makes us imitators. And to enjoy that adoption, that wonderful blessing, God and feed, to put that in our hearts and maintain it as something that moves us and drives us. Go back to 1 John 3, verse 1. We're going to close there with that same idea. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. A great thing that is. It only happens through adoption. And that only happens through conversion. To bring this lesson to a close, we remind you of the invitation of Christ. The invitation to you to be adopted into this house, into his family, and into that promise. And what a remarkable thing. Yet it's a right that the believer has to exercise. And so I guess in terms of maybe aren't uh, the most poetic, but are certainly true. We ask you this night if you're not a Christian to exercise that right. To become a child of God. To put on your Savior of baptism. And to be buried with Him. To rise in the waters of baptism to walk in the